Hello, welcome to the video. So today is going to be a little bit different. I had my friend Des, she actually came and we were able to do a interview in person. So I haven't done one of those in quite a while. Um, and we had a quite a lengthy talk about her journey, losing a ton of weight, having uh, different like weight loss surgeries, having complications from certain surgeries. She's had a pretty insane story um, and she was very open about everything. Uh, this video again is probably more of a podcast than anything. So feel free to like, you don't have to watch the entire video obviously, but if you do want to listen again, as you can see by the runtime, it was a quite a long talk, but I do think that everything that was shared is worth hearing. Um, I really enjoy doing these interview type videos where I can just let someone share their story because I do think that everyone's story is unique and you can learn something from every single person. Um, so again, Des, thank you so much for doing this. If you're interested, I will leave all of her links in the description so you can go ahead and follow her. Uh, but yeah, without further ado, I hope you enjoy the video. Thank you so much for coming here. Thank I really do appreciate me. it. I haven't done like an in-person one in a while, so I'm, I apologize if I'm kind of rusty, all right? It's been a while. I'm used to Zoom now. Don't be so hard on yourself. You do great on camera. Yeah, uh, <laughs> sometimes. I, I'll try not to interrupt too much, okay? They get mad sometimes. I get too excited. Well, I'm um, a talker. We'll see who actually does the interrupting. Yeah, we'll see. Well, if you interrupt me, that's good because it's supposed to be your story, not me, <laughs> okay? Okay. Um, okay, so... Recently, the, I've obviously known who you are for a while. Like, you're friends with a lot of my friends. Right, we have a lot of social media friends. space. Yep. But it was brought to my attention that there's been a lot of, like, surgeries and then complications and then you making videos about those that have gone kind of, like, viral, if you want to say, hit the algorithm. People have been talking about it, right? Yes. And so that's kind of how I came to, I don't want to say know who you are, but, like, that's been uh, something that's been happening recently. Before we get into that, because I like these videos to be about the person and how they got to the point where you would even want to consider getting weight loss surgery, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, tell me the story of how you got to your highest weight and then what was your click moment of deciding, you know, I think surgery is, uh, you know, the, the choice for me. This is what makes sense and go yeah. from there, I guess. Okay, yeah. So, um, for those of you guys who don't know, um, my name's Des and I had gastric bypass surgery five years ago. Wow, feels so long ago. But what led me to getting my gastric bypass was, it wasn't like I got into my college years and I got like the college 20 that turned to 40, 80. I was, it was like I was 23 years old and I was nearly 300 pounds. I was avoiding the scale because I had seen 298 and I knew I was hitting 300 any day. So at that point I was never gonna be stepping on the scale to face that reality, absolutely not. So that's when I started exploring weight loss surgery, but I gotta take it back even further because my weight gain has been, like not my weight gain, the issue of like actual obesity has been my entire life. Okay, so, so you, you struggle with your weight like forever basically. Forever, okay. like I've never known life outside of being the heavy kid, mm -hmm. like ever. So I am a twin and- Oh really? Yes, I actually am, uh, my twin and I are the youngest of six. There's five girls, one boy, and my twin has always been so skinny. The people who have worked at our schools, they would wonder if she was eating at home because she was skin and bones. Dude, that's that has to be. Yeah. Sorry, that's that's the whole thing. Yeah, I know. that's that has to be like for you mentally. Yes, yes, and then I have um, my, all my older sisters, walking Barbie dolls. Guys that see my sisters, they're like, oh my gosh, those are your sisters my entire life, walking Barbie dolls. And then it was me, just the youngest of the bunch double, triple the size of all of them. Never made any sense. So, taking it back, I was 90 pounds at five years old in preschool, 90 pounds. So I was always just the big tubby kid on the playground and at eight years old, I was finally diagnosed with hypothyroid disease. Mm. So that was like our big answer as to why I was eating the same as all my siblings, doing all the same sports activities, playing outside on my bike and scooter, my little scooters and razor scooters all the time. I was never a kid who sat inside watching TV. Um, and because I was heavy, my mom didn't want me in home. Like it was like, hey, you need to be outside playing. You need to be outside playing. As my twin sister, Destiny, Destiny and Desiree, it does get a little confusing. <laughs> Just call me Des. So Destiny, she would get, you know, Cheetos for her snack. And mm -hmm. I had other orange baby carrots. Uh. So it was like, kind of always like one of those things. Um, I went to my first children's boot camp at five years old, um, where we they taught us how to you know read the food pyramid and how to do jumping jacks and five years old. Yeah, so that's officially when I started my weight loss journey when I was put into a children's boot camp, literally, and nothing was ever really working. I was gaining weight every single year. Mm -hmm. Every year I was just 
a new size, mm-hmm. just bigger. It, I, I never experienced any actual weight loss. It was just mainly yeah, learning how to lose weight. Literally the same. Like, that's how I felt. Like, I, every year at school, when we go back to school shopping, it was just a bigger size t-shirt. Like, yes. it's just like, how it was. The back to school shopping, well, I relate to that so heavy. Uh, I always hated it, especially going with my siblings, because I would have to go shop in the women's section. Yeah. Well, they got to go to like limited too mm-hmm. with the sparkly cute little kids clothes. Yeah, never me. Couldn't be me. I had to shop in the Walmart Jordash jeans, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. So great. But um, yeah, that was always my childhood. And, you know, just in hopes to get me on the right track, I was placed in every sport you could think of. Every community sport. I did the AYSO soccer. I did the VYBA. I did volleyball, basketball, uh, soccer. I did ballet, tap dancing, hula dancing. I did a fireman academy. As I got older into high school and I got to make my own choices with what sports I was involved in, I did swim team, water polo, and track and field. Not the track part, just the field part. Uh (laughs) And um, yeah, it was was a whole thing, but it's not like I ever experienced weight loss from doing any of those things. Mm -hmm. It was just like, I was a really active, big kid. Mm -hmm. And like, I could keep up. Like, I was never the best one on the team or anything. But for being like a big kid, I, I always kept up. And I always did my best to not allow my weight to like hold me back from anything. So like, I'd still have major social groups. I had lots of friends growing up. I had never experienced any bullying Mm -hmm. and um, I was always really active. Like, and everyone always at least saw my efforts. Even Mm -hmm. my primary doctor who has been my doctor since I was literally a child. Mm -hmm. Once I got out of high school, I think it was like, I was probably 20 or 21 when she first brought up the word gastric bypass. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, well, I've heard of people getting these surgeries, of course, but I've never considered it because, I mean, I'm over here going to the gym. And once I was in college and not in sports, then I turned my routine into two two day gym sessions. Like I was always on a mission to Mm -hmm. lose this weight and never seeing any progress. And if I did ever see any progress, which I started to see a little bit in my early 20s when I was going to the gym a lot with my um, sisters and I would lose like maybe 20 pounds in like the first four to six weeks and you know how it is when you're heavy like you can, yeah, you, once you, you start can getting really lose active it relatively easily I don't yeah. it's not easy but it's like it's the first easy, little bit is easier but that first 20 pounds can be fast sometimes yeah, yeah. and by fast I mean like a month maybe two months if you're like super consistent like where I was hitting it twice a day and like really like watching what you're eating like I saw a 20 pound weight loss, but then it just kind of plateaued and I would never see anything further than that. And then it would go back to gaining that 20 pounds, losing it again, but never seeing any actual progress. So I did start exploring the route of weight loss surgery and there's like a huge list of appointments you have to get through just to even be approved. Mm -hmm. So like you have to go see a psychologist because you need to know like, if you're going to get this surgery, you need to understand, should I get this? Ah, whatever, it's fine. (laughs) Like, if you're going to get this surgery, you need to understand that you're not going to be waking up looking like Beyonce the next day, and this is not going to be the quick fix. If you are depressed over who you are as a person because of your weight, you need to understand that this surgery is not going to take away your depression overnight. So there's a lot of things to tackle there. you got to see a psychologist, therapist, sleep apnea tests, I mean, and you have blood to, work. And you have to change how you eat, right? Yes. Like, so yes. as far as your diet when you were at like your heaviest... Do you feel like now that maybe you know more about nutrition, do you think, okay, maybe I wasn't doing what I thought I was doing? Or do you feel like you were trying everything and it was just like the hypothyroidism was really It truly you was the hypothyroidism because you want to know what a typical day looks like for me. Yeah. And now that I'm older and more educated, I know that this is starvation and not healthy. So don't mm-hmm. take this as like my trick, yeah, yeah, okay? Yeah, don't do this. This yeah. is just what I did in the beginning thinking like I'm trying really freaking hard to lose weight. I did two slim fast shakes for breakfast and lunch and my dinner was a lettuce wrapped turkey and mustard sandwich. I never allowed myself mayonnaise or even cheese. And I ate like that through while I started like water polo and swim up into like my years of going into college. And then I kind of got really into like meal prepping, like when meal prepping like became like a really big thing to Mm -hmm. do in like 2013. Yep, I remember. I got really into it. And I would do lots of veggies and chicken. Like Mm -hmm. I really cut out carbs and sugars and like I would borderline starve myself and still not see any results. And that was on top of going to the gym twice a day. I would be using my fitness pal and I would try to focus on like, all right, as long as I'm burning more calories than I'm eating, how could I not lose weight? So that was what I was doing. Toxic, okay, we learned. Yeah. But that's what I was doing and it was just insane to like know that, wow, I could be starving myself this much, making this many restrictions and still not see anything. And um, yeah, I think it really does boil down to like the hypothyroidism giving me like basically a non-existent metabolism. Mm-hmm. 
And yeah, it was like really hard. And so like during the process of trying to go through gastric bypass, there were obviously a lot of people in my ear like, hey Des, don't you wanna just do that the natural way? You sure you want a surgery? And I'm like, well, anyone that knows me knows that I've been on a weight loss journey since I was five years old. I yeah. have tried everything under the sun. And I obviously am not so quick to get the surgery. Like it does scare me. My family's scared of it. Mm -hmm. Everyone in my life was afraid of it. But I knew a few people in person and um, like I used to do a lot of work like in the wedding industry so I was working as a gown stylist at the, like say yes to the dress I was like the girl that helped you say yes to your dress oh, okay. and through that job I actually my boss and then a few other people who came in they were like I had gastric bypass surgery I had the sleeve and they looked amazing and like they would you know as I'm helping them in their wedding dresses they'd be like oh my loose skin and I'm like mm -hmm. wow that's from like losing weight like I mm -hmm. became aware of this weight loss surgery bariatric surgery and so I went through the process, all these appointments, the sleep apnea test, the psychologist, all of that. And then I did allow like people's opinions to get in the way because I was like, wow, everyone's going to judge me for taking the easy way out. So then I totally dropped the ball on it. Three years really? later. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That all started when I was like 20 or 21. Okay. Then three years later, I found myself even heavier and I was like, wow, I'm definitely 300 pounds and mm -hmm. it's, it's not going anywhere. Yeah. And the click moment that you want to know about. Mm -hmm. It was really embarrassing and it was like, I cannot live like this anymore. I went to Disneyland. It was like in November. It was, you know, the best time to go to Disneyland. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wearing my rose gold ears, matching rose gold eyeliner, 300 pound girl, you know, I was still cute and trendy. And I stood in line for two hours with my family and you know, I got a big family. Mm -hmm. My mom in her fifties, no problem getting on this ride. She's on the ride. All my siblings are on the ride, putting down the bar. And then it's my turn and I can't get it down. I feel my face turning so red and hot and I'm just like, oh my gosh, no, this is not happening. And I, it looks like everyone in the line right here yeah, is staring, staring at, at me you, like, yeah. is this girl gonna be able to get on the ride? And I'm just like, this is not happening to me. This is not happening to me. A worker comes, tries to help. Hey, can someone else help me? Oh. All right, we're calling in for backup. Yeah. Disneyland is getting quiet. You hear the crickets, yeah, okay? Yeah. Second backup comes, they couldn't get it. They call for a third. I've got three workers pushing down on the bar. It's it's a show. We are watching the big girl who's only yeah. 23 years old, not being able to fit on this Disneyland ride while her mom and her entire family can after they just waited in two hour line. I had to say, no, it's, it's okay, it's fine. It's up. fine, yeah. I'll just go wait at the end, put my sunglasses on, told my family I'll be right at the exit. I. I mean, I've never been so embarrassed in my life. That's it was tough. humiliating. So I felt like all well, eyes like, were on me. Like the rest of the day, you're just like, I just want to leave. Now. I just want to leave. Like you don't, you don't even want to chance it on another. Why ride. am I gonna like, go in another line? Why, why am I gonna go in a line? Because I hadn't experienced Disneyland at this size. It had been a few years yeah. since I, I had been there. I had something close. It was at, I was at Six Flags, and there was one that mm. it, it was like barely fit, and I just didn't go on any rides afterwards. Yeah, you're like, you I can't, just too lied close about. I was like, my stomach doesn't feel well, so I'm not gonna go on any rides. I just lied because yeah, yeah. I was like, nah, like I can't, I can't. And I was in tenth grade at the time. Like oh, I yeah. wanted, I wanted to go on them, but. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally get it. So that was my big click moment when it couldn't click. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <I> <laughs> the unclicked moment. Um, but yeah, that was like, I, I remember I was like 23 years old at that point and I was like, I, this is no way for a 23 year old to live. And so, yeah, that was November. And I went back to my doctor, my primary doctor. Um, well, actually I had tried calling the surgeon she had set me up with three years prior. And they were like, I'm so sorry, but that was three years ago. All of those tests, the studies, the people you, you met gotta, with, yeah. you got to redo everything. Like yeah. we need updates. So you got to go get a new referral from your primary. I visit my primary and she's like, well, now we're just starting this whole process again. Um, when you could have had this done three years ago. And I'm like, well, I understand that, yeah. but I'm ready now. I am more educated. I did a lot more research. I, I mean, I, I think that that's always a good route to take like maybe not letting people's opinions but i mean being not very, being so quick to surgery yeah like yeah don't let people's opinions be the thing that stops you but also don't just think that a surgery's gonna be a quick fix yeah. and dive I, into it i've told the story like when i was in i think i was in 10th grade as well i almost got the lap band because they were doing i didn't know that yeah they were doing um studies here at ucsd for um adolescents that have obesity no way and so i almost got it like completely free and like it was crazy because like all these other kids, this is what one of the- um, On an adolescent. Yeah. This is what the, wow. uh, one of the doctors told us, like when I went and met with him, I was like, he was like, so how ready are you for this? And I was like, I don't know, like 80% sure. <laughs> and he was actually like, that's good. Like everyone else is like, I want it. 
because it's like they think this is gonna solve everything. Yeah. This is it. And for me, I've, I've, I'm, it's clear, people that watch the channel know I'm not a fan of going under. It's terrifying. I got my wisdom teeth out recently, and that was, like, freaking scary. Oh. Luckily, it was really easy. But so um, I, I ended up not getting it because I think I just got cold feet, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think, like, he even said, like, it's good that you're, like, you should understand this is a serious thing. Right? Yeah, that is actually really <clears throat> And good. so, again, like... Maybe you're not stoked that it was because other people made you kind of feel a certain way, but I don't know. Like, I think it's good to take things for what they are, and like, totally. if it's serious, it's serious, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. So, yeah, I ended up going through the whole entire process all over again, and one of the reasons why she was like, you know, why why did you drop the ball last time? I was like, well, your dietitian wanted me to keep on losing more and more weight, because that's another thing. They want you to lose a certain percent of your mm -hmm. body fat. And I'm like, the issue is losing. Like, yeah. I, I'm trying everything. And so I was like, I couldn't lose the amount that your dietitian wanted me to. And also I was allowing all these opinions to come in. And also the people, the few people that I knew that had success with this surgery, they all went through a doctor that was not covered through my insurance. Mm -hmm. So I always thought maybe I'll go through that doctor like when I'm like out of college and can mm -hmm. pay for the surgery and I won't just rely on my insurance to cover it. And she was like, well, what doctor? And I was like, oh, it's Dr. Billy. Like, he's a legend. He's, like, the type of surgeon that puts on, like, retreats and seminars mm -hmm. for other upcoming bariatric surgeons to, like, learn from. Like, he's, like, up there. He's like, like, he the teaches guy. the guys. Yeah, yeah. So um, I always knew about his, like, amazing reputation. And I told my doctor this, and she was like, wow, well, I've got some news for you. Mm -hmm. As of two weeks ago, your insurance actually is now covered by Dr. Billy, and no mm -hmm. one even knows about it, so there's no wait list. So this surgery that can usually take a year, up to two years to get, mm. I was already scheduled for my surgery in December. I had seen her in November, the oh, week wow. after Disneyland. Holy crap. And I yeah, went in month. on December 29th. Wow. I was right before New Merry Year's. Merry Christmas. <laughs> yeah. And I really did push for that because at the time, I was a full-time student in Beverly Hills going to school for ultrasound. Mm -hmm. So, and it was like a trade school. So like if you missed a certain amount of days, you'd have to redo the entire uh, like little yeah, yeah. module or yeah yeah I'm blanking like on that. the yeah I've been, I've been out of school for a while mm -hmm. but um, you'd have to like redo the entire semester all over again if you miss more like more than like four days so I was really trying to like tell them like if any openings come up while I'm on my Christmas break please get me in and I was able to get in mm -hmm. and it was amazing I felt like everything was like falling into place like wow it's like what a god thing you know the surgeon I always wanted is now covered by my insurance so I get to go through for free it completely covered it because of my prior, you know, health issues mm -hmm. with like the hypothyroid and because my primary doctor had been part of my life for this long, mm -hmm. like she knew all of the efforts that had already been made. She knew everything that I've always tried. So like I was a really good candidate yeah. for the weight loss surgery. So it all happened so fast. I went in. Can I ask before, before we go, you had the gastric bypass mm -hmm. and I know the sleeve is a lot I would say it's a lot more popular now. Um, so popular that I'm pretty much the only gastric bypass okay. pastor online. Why is there any reason for that? Was there a reason why they like they they said maybe gastric bypass instead of the sleeve? Like, I'm just kind yes, of yeah. I, that's a huge question. Um, a lot of people get the sleeve simply because it is a bigger pouch. So think about someone who is dealing with obesity their whole life. There are usually a lot more like food addictions and eating disorders that come along with mm -hmm. that. So the idea of eating one ounce is really scary. That's mm -hmm. gastric bypass, one okay. ounce meals. Okay. Now with the sleeve, you have to think of it more of like a banana sized stomach. So that's like four to six ounce meals. Okay. That's a little less scary. It's kind of just like cutting your portions down a little mm -hmm. bit. Where someone that, uh, how my surgeon explained it to me was someone's stomach is about the size of a football when you have gastric bypass, mm -hmm. it is the size of an egg. Mm -hmm. So my meals that I would meal prep after gastric bypass were out of shot glasses. That's one ounce that's meals. so crazy. I know. Sorry, my eyelash is like pointing downward. It's all good. <laughs> okay, so, and then, so you, you get the surgery, right? And yes. then, so what, what's the, what, what happens after that? So I get the surgery and for the first time in my life, I start experiencing actual weight loss. Mm -hmm. And I would consider this rapid weight loss because just within the little liquid diet that I was on for the first five days before my surgery that I had to follow. So after the surgery, you have to follow a very strict diet. It's kind of like... A newborn think about a baby yeah, yeah. you wouldn't give your baby steak mm -hmm. or chicken you're like giving milk and mm -hmm. so you're on a liquid diet and then the liquids progress to semi liquids and then semi soft foods and then just normal foods but um being on the liquid diet for close to probably a month i lost like 40 pounds a month like that is I, the only reason I could even have any sort of reference was because I had to be on a soft food diet for like... For your resin tea? Yeah, not for a lot long. 
it was like a couple days. Okay. But I remember being like, this sucks. I'm over it, okay? I don't want to eat <laughs> applesauce anymore. I, I've had enough smoothies, yeah. all right? Yeah. And so I can only, and I was like going crazy. I just wanted chips and yes. french fries. You want right? to chew on something. You want to do this. Months, like I, I want to be, oh, dude, Yeah, I know. so it's hard. hard. That was honestly one of the reasons why I didn't get the, uh, the lap band. Because they were like, yeah, you have to do liquid diet for a while. And I was just like, what? And, and then a big one, if I'm being honest, they're like, yeah, you can't have any carbonated drinks. And I was like, uh, what? <laughs> okay, they say that, no, but hold up, hold up they now. just want you to not be having soda. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. they don't want you to be drinking your calories. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like when it comes to carbonation, there are certain things I could still have, but like certain things that are just too carbonated, like mm -hmm. certain energy drinks, I'm like, oh. Yeah. I feel like that's going to make me ugh, like kind of burp a little bit. Yeah. But there are other things where it has carbonation and I'm totally fine. Mm -hmm. They just kind of try to like scare you up a little bit. I get it. Yeah, I think that's why that when I got my wisdom teeth, they're like, you can't use a straw. Yes. But like I think it's mainly because they, they say smoothies is one of the things that you can eat. And like obviously if you're trying to drink a smoothie through a straw, you have to like suck really hard. Yes. And then you have the issues with the dry socket, I think it's called. Because mm -hmm. I remember I, like a couple days ago, it's been like two weeks since I've had it now, almost. Oh, you don't even uh, have any swelling. No, I didn't have any swelling at all. At oh, wow. Like it was a really easy, like I had no issues. Like I didn't That's have. great for you. I didn't have any pain. Wonderful. Literally no pain. Like it was. Yeah, but I remember I was I was at the mall and I had gotten an iced coffee and I was just walking around and I was drinking it and I realized, oh crap. But I was like, I, I think it's fine. Like, I'm not like, like really trying, you yeah. know, but Sometimes I'm sorry. Sometimes they're concerned with like the air that yeah. comes with it too. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if it's that serious. Yeah, I but know. who knows? Hopefully, we'll, we'll find out if I end up having dry sockets in the night. Let us know. Yeah, yeah. yeah keep us posted. <laughs> um, but yeah, so after doing like the liquids, I had already been like 40 pounds down. Yeah, and I was like, well, that's pretty insane. Especially because, like, I'm interrupting. I know. I'm sorry. But, no, like, you're good. You're it's, good. it's, you, what you've explained a lot is how I felt. Now, I had, you had a genuine reason. I just didn't know what I was doing. But I remember when I was growing up, I tried to lose weight a bunch of times. I never saw any results. Okay. Like, I never, ever lost weight and gained it back. Like, I think the most I lost was maybe 10 pounds. Okay. Right? Yeah. And so I just genuinely thought I can't lose weight. And so for me, once I saw that I could do it, I was like, oh, okay, I can do yes. this. And I just remember that that like happening in my mind was such a huge shift for me because yeah. it was like no longer, oh, I'm broken and I can't. It was like, oh, no, no, I can do it. I just have to continue. Yeah, I could totally relate to that. I remember being like at my heaviest and I would find myself in, it was a roller coaster mm -hmm. being, you know, when you're at that size, you're somewhere between all I want is a body other than my own because I feel like no matter how hard I try, this is never going to change. Mm -hmm. So then it leads you to this point of, okay, so then how do I work on loving myself and accepting it for what it is? How do I accept that you're going to be the big girl forever? You're going to just be the big sister. You're going to be the big one on the team. You're going to be the big girl in the room everywhere you go. And how do you just accept the fact that you will be 300 pounds for the rest of your life? Mm -hmm. It's not going anywhere. So I would find myself there too, like, just accept it, just accept it, love yourself in the, in the way. And so like, and of course, like I would do a pretty good job of that sometimes, but like that roller coaster, I mean, the lows are pretty low yep. when you're there. Mm -hmm. So I'll be honest there. It's like, you could stand in the mirror and completely hate yourself and just, and then I think about how much time and just years of my life I wasted living in that kind of deep self hate that mm -hmm. I wouldn't allow other people to see because yeah. what other people saw was I was the girl at 300 pounds that still was the life of the party, bubbly everywhere I went. I still went out with my friends. Like I would put in so much effort in how I looked, my hair and makeup and outfits. I would try to be as trendy as possible at 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. It didn't, to other people, it didn't look like it affected me the way mm -hmm. it did. But in those roller coasters, in the lows, mm -hmm. I mean, the lows got pretty low. I hated, I hated what I saw. Yeah. And I wanted nothing but a different life outside of that. Mm -hmm. And just to think about never knowing life outside of actual obesity, I, I, I would just like to know what yeah. would it feel like, you know? So yeah, just finally seeing the results. I mean, I was stoked. Mm -hmm. It was the first time I ever experienced not having pain in my ankles mm -hmm. and my knees. It was the first thing to go away. Mm -hmm. And I was a barista um, at the time, also a full-time student for ultrasound. And I would have to go after, I would have to cut my shifts to only four hour shifts when I was that size because I couldn't even be on my feet that long. They would get so big, I couldn't even fit shoes on to certain shoes on my feet. Yeah. Go home, put them up on the wall. And within my first week of surgery, I never had any other swelling. And it was just crazy because it was like the first thing to resolve that and just like the pain I would feel in my like lower mm -hmm. extremities. So like I was just so stoked. I was like, wow, it's actually working. And I mean, after like, you know, dealing with your weight like that long for your whole life, you think, like you go into it thinking, watch, I'm gonna be the one person the surgery doesn't work for. Mm -hmm. But I was seeing a little bit of results. I was getting pretty stoked. 
and that really did like you know motivate me and it, it sucks to like say like you found motivation within seeing the results because where yes. you know where can you be motivated without seeing results but like oh my gosh I was just so glad to finally see a change in the scale mm -hmm. so like it really did give me the motivation to just like stick to stick to the book mm -hmm. if they wanted me on one ounce meals I was gonna stay on one ounce meals you want me to wait six months to be able to eat chicken sure I will do it mm -hmm. and I didn't I didn't even go my first year after having weight loss surgery I never once went to uh, like fast food restaurant yeah never once I just like I wanted to do everything by the book I weighed everything out with a scale mm -hmm. and I use these little containers that people would say oh my gosh I use that for my ranch when I pack my lunches uh -huh. they were one to two ounce little containers and those were my meal prep containers I would take them with me put them in the microwave at school my <laughs> the students they'd be like Des you're gonna die like mm -hmm. how is that your lunch yeah. I'd be like it's lunchtime. Yeah. Two bites and I'm done. Mm -hmm. And everyone was just like mind blown. But like, I would make sure that those were packed with protein. I always mm -hmm. had like ground turkey. Um, that was like the first meat that I could like reintroduce back in. So like mm -hmm. that and like eggs were like and cheese were like my best like protein sources on top of just lots of protein shakes. But yeah, sticking to like just like the diet they wanted me to stay on and just actually following these rules and guidelines they want you to follow. Like a lot of people can't follow these guidelines mm -hmm. and I think that's why a lot of people don't find success within the surgery but if there was anything I could follow were some rules and guidelines mm -hmm. I've always been a very disciplined person I've done sports I've done like everything I've tried every other weight loss regimen before like I know how to follow some rules and guidelines you just tell me what to do mm -hmm. and I was just stoked to start seeing the yeah. results by six months I had already lost 100 pounds and according to other people who get like these surgeries they usually don't it doesn't usually happen at the six month mark. It's mm -hmm. usually closer to like maybe a year afterwards. Mm -hmm. So like I was really stoked. Um, I started just like seeing like better results than even some of the other people I knew. Like it was happening to me faster. Like I was getting better results than at this point, just by losing the hundred pounds, I was already at further along than the people I knew personally who had it years ago. Mm -hmm. So I was like, wow, it really pays to follow these rules and guidelines. And I just knew that all it took was just following it. So um, I stuck with those meals and when I hit my one year mark, actually it was just a few days before my one year mark because my surgery was on December 29th, my birthday is on December 23rd right before Christmas and I weighed myself on my birthday and I hit my very first, my first goal weight ever was to be 150 pounds and that's when the first day I saw 149, I had uh -huh. exceeded it and I was like wow that's insane. Mm -hmm. So like I had my birthday and I was, it was my first birthday I ever had, not yeah, yeah. big standing next to my twin almost looking her same size it was insane i mean yeah. like i look back at those videos and like we had these little like confetti outfits from forever 21 and i could never shop the same size as her if i was shopping forever 21 it was the forever 21 plus yeah yeah and we got to wear matching outfits on our birthday we always try to do matching stuff because we're twins but like it was literally always like mary kate and ashley vibes where it was like yeah. close but not quite like it's gonna be opposites because yeah. i had to go find something different we could never do something the same so yeah, like that was our first birthday where like we like actually looked closer to twins than ever and yeah. I was at 149 pounds. But what I will say is I felt, and I could look at pictures from that day, I was pale, mm -hmm. yeah, I looked really weak, there was no muscle in my body even though I was hitting the gym every single day, weight training two hours a day while being a full time student, doing my barista job, doing my wedding jobs, mm -hmm. I, I was doing my, I do like calligraphy on the side as well. So like, I've always been a little hustler, like I've got a million things going on all the time, but it was just like, I'm stoked to be at this weight, but why do I look like low key, like sickly? Mm -hmm. Like I looked sick. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I decided, you know, like I'm stoked to be at 150 pounds. I never thought I would ever be here. But what could happen if I, take this to the next level and like do a focus on like gaining muscle. Mm -hmm. And then I got connected with my coach, Maddie. Um, we met through Instagram and- So is that, is this when you started posting on Instagram? No, I actually started posting within my year. Like, okay, so you had, you had already started posting. Yeah, um, so I got my surgery on December 29th. I mm -hmm. made that page in, Jan in that January, so like about a month later. Okay. And then I think I made my first post like the last week of January. So like it was like a month into my journey. Okay. I was like, I'm gonna make a page and document everything. Mm -hmm. So I had been sharing everything. And um, I hit, um, I think uh, I had hit, hit, hit the explore page for the very first time when I went to Stagecoach last year. So okay. that year I had gone to Stagecoach every year with my family. We always win tickets on the radio. And um, I had this little like cowboy hat side by side of, uh, and it hit, went, hit the explore yeah, page and it yeah. went viral. And that was the first time I ever had like a, side-by-side -side, Transmission Tuesday post mm -hmm. go viral and 
it kind of just like picked up from there and then that October is when I got the little K, 10K and I was like, cool, I guess we're just gonna do this thing and just mm -hmm. keep sharing online. So I've always kind of shared from the very beginning, like as soon as I got the idea too, like that January, yeah. like a month in, but um, Maddie, she had the idea of me tracking macros and she gave me these numbers and I was like, hold on girlfriend, you don't understand, I'm a bariatric patient. Yeah. These numbers, I cannot Can't physically eat, yeah. eat that much. And she was like, I know, but your body will actually change if you at least try. And mm -hmm. if you're having a hard time, try splitting up or we could try like finding like higher calorie things or like just figure out how to like prioritize protein more. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot to learn and it was such a big adjustment, especially cause I was getting so full and it wasn't about trying to stretch out the stomach, but trying to figure out how to stretch out my meals into multiple meals a day, just to like meet those mm -hmm. goals, the protein goals and everything like that. And I can't even tell you the difference my body started seeing once I started actually eating cause my surgeon would recommend 60 grams of protein. When I started working with a coach, and she was not working, I was her very first ever bariatric mm -hmm. um, client. And I was given, I wanna say, probably like a 90 to 100 gram protein goal, and like I still pretty much follow that. And I was like, wow, that's a lot for someone who's had bariatrics. And like anyone who's had WLS is probably listening like, oh, Desi, it's 100 grams, people still freak out. They're like, that's crazy, you've stretched out your stomach, I'm mm -hmm. sure of it. Well, I just had surgery and they say it's not stretched out, so mm -hmm. thank you. But um, yeah, it's just like crazy because like once you actually start eating more protein, like I started actually getting muscles. Yeah. Like it was so much well, fun. That's like, it was that's a change. Like one of the things that I know a lot of people when they talk about like bariatric surgery and why they're maybe like not a huge fan of it is because like you are so limited on the yes. amount that you can eat, but then like as far as like gaining muscle, it becomes significantly harder. Yes. Right? Especially yes. like I know dudes, like that's something that they're worried about, they which I, I understand. Grow. Yeah. And so and then like it's it's interesting hearing that kind of story about getting down to that lowest weight but then not being happy. I think a lot of people they think that the low weight is going to be the thing that makes it happy. But in in reality I think for most people, you want to feel good at the end of the day, right? Yes. So you could be at your lowest weight. Like when I got down to 180 pounds when I competed, yeah, cool. But I felt like death. And like, I knew that I had to get as low as I, well, I didn't have to, but I wanted to get as low as I could to be, you know, as stage ready as I can be. Totally. And, but it didn't feel great, you know? And I think a lot of people, they forget that weight loss is a, it is a period of time that will end, hopefully, right? Yes. And then you have to transition from there. And I always tell people, if you don't have a plan for when you get to that point, the, the chances of you failing and just gaining the weight back, I think, rise significantly because you're like, why am I not happy at this low weight? A lot of times, that low weight is too low for yeah. a lot of people, right? Like, yeah. it's too low, right? And so, it's just interesting hearing that. Yeah, yeah, it's always different when you have, oh my gosh, I'm stepping on stage in X amount of weeks, mm -hmm. months. Yeah, it's gonna put a different kind of fire under you, but mm -hmm. then what happens when you're not getting ready to step on stage, you know? Where's the plan? I totally get it. Um, but yeah, so I did start, my whole body started changing once I started actually eating more and it felt so crazy and wrong to do because I was like, oh my gosh, am I stretching out my stomach? It's not like I'm like causing myself to throw up. Mm -hmm. I'm just getting smarter at how I'm spacing them out and getting smarter at what items I'm buying that are higher in protein and mm -hmm. like lower in fat. That's another thing. When I first started, um, totally during the time of like keto being the thing to do, right? So I've totally followed like close to a keto diet. I wasn't like one of those people that like knew if I was in ketosis and everything. Mm -hmm. like, I didn't yeah, know what I was do, doing. Like, the strips or anything like that. Exactly, yeah. But I was staying low carb. Low carb, yeah. So almost non-existent. I'd be like, just stay, keep me away from carbs. And I was doing lots of high fat, high protein. And of course it helped me get to my 150 pound weight loss goal. Say, like it works, it, it gets yeah. you to lose weight, but for a lot of people they just don't feel good on it. Exactly. Know, like... And it was so crazy because then when I started getting macros, Maddie showed me like my carbs were almost as much as my protein. And I was like, you want me to be eating this many carbs? Mm -hmm. But then my fat was like this low, never done anything like it, but like, sure, I guess I'll try. Like I said, I can follow a couple rules, give it a go. And oh my gosh, I literally started gaining muscle I started getting like, I don't know, color in my face, like mm -hmm. everything people started noticing. They're like, Des, like you just look so good. You look so healthy. And from eating more, I thought 150 pounds was my goal. Mm -hmm. I started losing more and I was like, wow, I felt great at 150, mm -hmm. but guess what? I'm feeling even better going and it's like turning into like lean muscle. Mm -hmm. Like I'm continuing to lose more weight, which a lot of people don't continue to lose weight a year after their weight loss mm -hmm. surgery. If anything, they're fighting through stalls, mm -hmm. they are going through regain, 
but I was continuing to lose just by switching up my routine. Yep. And on top of tracking macros, I also, for the first time ever, had added in a step goal. I was doing, That's I wild. started at 8,000, then the next week 9,000, and I stuck to 10,000 yeah. for like a month. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Like, one of the things that a lot of people think like, oh, eat more means I lose weight. And it's like, well, kind of, right? It's like, for a lot of people, you're eating more, so you have more energy, and so you're, you're, your NEAT or non-exercise activity thermogenesis goes higher. Yeah. So you're moving more and so you're burning more calories but you don't even realize it because you're just like, I'm not dead because I'm eating nothing. Yeah. Like, and that's what happens to a lot of people. So they're like, yeah, I, I wasn't eating enough. That's why I was gaining weight. It's like, yep. kind of, but not really, you know? Yeah. Everyone's just, everyone um, is out here trying to learn what, what's working and I feel like I like the keto, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I've tried everything and it's all through like learning experience and like until I start doing something I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like you make these own realizations in your head like, wow, carbs are what's actually doing it. Okay, cool. Steps, mm -hmm. adding steps. Okay, cool. Like, yeah, it takes a little extra time out of my day, but I ended up getting even like, I don't know what, um, abdominal definition yeah. even from that. And it was just like adding steps on top of tracking macros and then... So that was like from January. So I had just done my whole year after a gastric bypass, mm -hmm. second year. So I spent January until like March just tracking macros and learning about it. And then that's when um, at the time I was dating someone who was getting ready for summer shredding, Christian Guzman's big bodybuilding show. And so it was like brought to my attention that there was like this transformation class. And I was like, oh, maybe that's something I would want to do. Like, yes, I know it's a crazy big commitment to just like track everything mm -hmm. and to like work up to becoming the smallest you can be. Yeah. Like that sounds crazy. And I was at 150, but then I was like around like 145 and I could never break it. Um, and like even tracking the macros, I was like at 145, but like a whole different body. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah it was only a five pound difference from what I was doing. But just looking at like w what my physique was turning into in just three months of tracking, it was a night and day difference. So mm -hmm. I was stoked on it. But um, I knew that I was gonna also wanna get into competing, but at this time in my life, I was finishing up my ultrasound school. I was in a six month internship at this point, done with the school part, like the classes part, and like in the hospital at Culver City Hospital. So I was like so busy just trying to get through that. And so I was like, all right, maybe I'll do the next show. So I went and I attended it and it was the most inspirational weekend of my life. I saw so many people who have been on journeys just like mine, step mm. on that stage, cry just cause like they show like your before and after mm. the top like eight people will have their video show. And mm. so like then you got to hear about their story and I was like, wow, like so much, but I cannot wait to be a part of it next year. So then I decide, all right, well, while I'm here with all this loose skin after losing the 150 pounds, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be competing this year anymore. I'm finishing up my ultrasound. That sounds like great timing to kind of take care of the loose skin. Mm -hmm. So I decide before I get into competing, let's get the tummy tuck, let's get the breast implants done, let's get the surgeries done out of the way so that way I could just be in the gym, hitting it hard, getting ready for summer shredding next summer. Mm -hmm. So I go in through the whole process of that and I get my hip to hip tummy tuck. Um, no extra abdominal stitching, no liposuction, literally just whatever was hanging is what they got cut off. It wasn't any extra special tummy tuck or anything. Mm -hmm. Just got my loose skin removed. That way I could finally see the progress that I worked so hard for. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know how it is like you dealing with loose skin, you're like, it's like you love it, you hate it. It's yeah. a victory. And then you're like, I really wonder what I would look like underneath mm -hmm. all that if it was gone. So I went through with it and I was super stoked. I had a really easy recovery with that. It was awesome. I was up and walking like the same day. And then I was like, wow, well, I know I'm also gonna wanna get my breast implants done. Like, I wanna get breast implants. I feel like I need to try to do these surgeries as back to back as possible so that I don't have to keep on taking time out of the gym and work. Yeah. Like, it, this is, recovery takes a lot of time out of your yeah. life. Yeah. And like, you gotta get to work, you gotta make money, you gotta get in the gym, like, you know. And I'm just like, okay, I, I don't want to spend any more time in recovery. So I ended up going through that surgery and I mean, unfortunately, I dealt with like an entire like allergic reaction and I had to get them removed and replaced with new ones. And then it turned into a six month recovery. But as soon as I was good is when I signed up for summer shredding mm -hmm. and I did my first show and I, then I lost even more weight. And so like I'm at my, my lowest weight for show day was 138 and I'm at, well, actually I'm at 130 right now. So it's like, I keep losing, mm -hmm. um, but right now I'm only losing because I'm in recovery and I've been on liquids, but mm -hmm. I've been maintaining 138 for a while. Mm -hmm. My show weight, 138, but 
it's funny because now since I'm not been in competing, I'm maintaining the same weight, but I've lost a lot of muscle definition. Mm -hmm. And like, that's what, that's what I care about. I could care yeah, less yeah. about any number on the scale, which is funny because I used to only care about the number on the scale. Mm -hmm. Being a big girl, all you want to do is see it keep going down. And that first year post-op, when you're going through rapid weight loss, it's the funnest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. Seeing every Monday, every oh, yeah. number just going lower. Mm -hmm. It's thrilling. It it's can be motivating. like addicting. Too, so though. addicting. Yeah. And then what happens, you know, your second year out when you're not going to have a new number every mm -hmm. week. So it's, it's just different. It's different times and seasons. But if I could just like focus on anything, it would just be like, I just want like muscle and yeah, like I'm not trying to get like crazy jacked or anything, mm -hmm. but like I, I'm more focused these days on just like, I want to like be strong and mm -hmm. feel healthy. I want to feel good. And, um, you know, I, I'm not focused on like where that's at. If it's in the one thirties, cool. If it was in the one forties, that'd be cool too. I don't mm -hmm. really care about the number, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel similar. Like the way that I see like lifting and stuff, obviously I'm a proponent of it for anyone that's trying to lose weight. I really do think that it is one of the things that really helps you keep weight off. Um, having, having more muscle one just means that you can burn more calories because muscle just requires more energy than say fat or just nothing having, just not having the muscle. Mm -hmm. But then on top of that, I think that it's, if, if you are going to the gym, if you want to go to the gym every day and like lift, it just gives you something to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> too and Second again home. it's just yeah and it just again like you, you'll meet people at the gym you end up finding that community that's all that stuff's really important right mm -hmm. for keeping the weight off and so i am obviously like i, I don't tell anyone you have to because you don't have to because a lot of people are very nervous to go to the gym i understand if you've never been you, you have the anxiety gym but anxiety I, I, is so real yeah. yeah i do think that it's worth pushing through if you can you know and like i'm just a huge proponent of like lifting and, and put in trying to put on muscle men and women like it is one of the most important things. Like when you're first losing the weight, I understand maybe if you don't want to go to the gym, but like if you're planning on keeping it off, get yourself into some sort of gym, work out at home, something to where you are trying to build some muscle. I yeah. think that it is it, very, very important. I love that you said that because I feel like, especially me being someone who comes from like the bariatric community, mm -hmm. right? I can't tell you how many people get this surgery and it will take them a year, two years, or they still have never found the courage or like that motivation to step foot into a gym or mm -hmm. to get a workout program that you can do at home or to just do a workout that you could find for free online in their yeah. own home. Mm -hmm. It's, they can't, it's just, it's too much anxiety. It's, it's too much for them. They can't bring themselves to do it. And I feel like what I'm like, yes, I share my journey online, but I feel like like the most important thing like I could ever speak to anyone from the WS community is just like, you would be so, surprised at what you can actually accomplish if you apply yourself and actually get yourself in there and actually just move past those fears because mm -hmm. I had the gym anxiety so bad too. Yeah. I would sit in my car for so long. I would look at every single person in the gym thinking they were looking at me too. Mm -hmm. Trust me, I was at, I was literally there. I would like be with mm -hmm. my sister who knew everything to do in the gym mm -hmm. and I'd be like, just tell me what to do and if, I'm look, if it looks stupid, please just do it. Tell me to stop, change mm -hmm. it really right, right away. If you need to find someone to go with you, mm -hmm. find someone, anyone, yeah. even if it's someone you met from Facebook or something. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, if you need to have someone that you like text the night before, like I'm gonna go to the gym tomorrow. Like you just need to find something that's gonna give you that extra push because I need people to stop relying on the surgery to give them the results they wanna see because they're never gonna get the just results not, yeah. you want from just relying mm -hmm. on the surgery. Yeah. And you might experience amazing weight loss that first year, but let me tell you, it slows down dramatically once you're a year out, mm -hmm. especially two years out. So many people go back for revisions. They will go back and get the surgery done all over again. They'll go from the sleeve to the gastric bypass because mm -hmm. the sleeve didn't work. Did the sleeve not work or did you not use your tool to the best yeah. of its ability? It's it's tough. It's like, like we've said, like people see surgery um, and then now with like Ozempic and stuff, like the injectables is like a, yeah. a magic bullet and it's just, it, it doesn't exist. Like those things help. Obviously they wouldn't exist if they didn't help. Um, but if you don't fix the mental and you don't figure stuff out and you just try and continue to eat freaking Ben and Jerry's every night, like <laughs> you're, you're eventually just going to get back to where you were, yeah. right? Like there is no, there's no one size fits all. Totally. But speaking of, you've been saying that you're in recovery from another surgery. Yes. So this has been a, a crazy story. Yes. So, so, so what happened there? What happened there? Why, why'd you have to have another one? <sighs> okay. So this is scaring a lot of people. So I don't want you to not be scared. I'll be okay. And I'm doing a lot better now, okay. so just know that. Okay. So, we're gonna have to rewind a little bit. Okay. So, as I'm going through my first year post-op from my gastric bypass, I'm tracking my macros, I'm hitting the gym, 
now with Maddie's workouts. You know, I'm doing things to build muscle. I'm totally switching up my routine. So um, I'm starting to go to the gym with a plan. I have tracking macros. I've got designated workouts. So I've got like certain leg days, certain upper body days. First time ever I had a plan mm -hmm. and it totally was working, right? I loved it. I was seeing so many good results. But, you know, as I'm sitting here in like my ultrasound school, as I'm working in the hospital, as I'm grocery shopping, sometimes I would be dealing with this stomach pain. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that stomach pain and I'm sorry, we're gonna get a little gross, I hope you don't have a weak stomach, but it would cause me to throw up these white bubbles mm. and it's just like stomach acid. And I'd be like, what the heck? Like, yeah, what's this stomach acid? And like, why is it so painful? Why does it feel like I have to like throw up so much, but the only thing that comes out is like a dime-sized white worst. puffy acid. And you're like, feel like you're just going forever and nothing comes up. Like yes. I had, I had the flu recently and it was <laughs> Yeah, like you're over here like, like dry heaving, your whole body's going yeah. into this like throwing up episode. But nothing's coming out besides mm -hmm. what a dime-sized white puffy yeah. white bubble thing, and I'm just like, what is it? So obviously, I bring it up with my surgeon, and he lets me know like, oh, it's probably like an overproduction of your stomach acid. It's very common um, after you know surgeries, especially with women. Like a lot of women deal with acid reflux and stuff, and I totally did before my weight loss surgery. But that was one of the very first things to resolve when I had it. Like after I had my gastric bypass, I don't think I've ever f once felt acid reflux right. here. Yeah. What I was dealing with was all stomach. Like I wasn't like, yeah, it would come up, but it wasn't like acid reflux. Yeah, and the heartburn. pain was emanating from here. Exactly. It was just like aftermath of this, and then it needed to come out. So I was dealing with this a lot. Like sometimes I would be in the middle of like taking a test at school, and I would just be like, oh my gosh, like the only thing I can do is apply pressure on it. And that sucks, the closer man. I bring my knees up to it and kind of curl, uh -huh. the best it would feel. So here I am just trying to get through the scantron, uh -huh. and I'd be like, oh my gosh. Heavy breathing, heavy breathing. My teachers would have to kind of just like excuse me and I'd be like, I am so sorry. I don't know what's going on. They would be scanning me in ultrasound school. We're, we all got ultrasound, yeah. out, ultrasound, why not check her out? Yeah. All of my teachers would try to help, bless their hearts, just uh -huh. so sweet. But there was nothing we could see besides, oh, there's the gastric bypass staple. Yeah. Students want to come see what a gastric bypass yeah. tummy looks like, but there was nothing else to see. So I was like, okay, like they're not seeing anything. Like my surgeon says it's like pretty normal. I just kind of had to deal with it pop some Tums, mm -hmm. I don't know, I would And you dealt with this for how, for how long? How long was this going on for? My whole year post-op. It oh would just be God. off and on. Like, maybe someday I'd have it, someday I wouldn't. How, like, how many times in, like, say a month do you feel like you would have, like, episodes? A few times a day. Oh maybe there would be a... You'd have, like, a couple days where it wasn't, but, like, for the most part, it was, like, every day. If there was, anything, like, there would be, like, a few days of the month where, like, hey, maybe I didn't really feel any stomach pain. Maybe. But, like, it was more often than not. Yes. A day would... It would mainly be, like, every day I have it at least once. Sometimes three times. Sometimes, like, it's, like, bad enough to where I'm, like, okay, i got to cancel today. Like, that's when it did kind of start becoming a problem. Yeah. And it started, like, affecting, like, you know, your daily activities and your daily life. So... That May, so about a year and five months post-op from my original gastric bypass, my surgeon's like, you know what? It's gotta be the gallbladder. Most people deal with gallbladder that, issues. I mean, that is that is true. A lot of people like that either that lose weight, especially if you lose weight quickly, your gallbladder, it's like very Yeah, common, rapid very, weight very loss common. does especially something to your women. body. Yeah. Sadly, it's always, especially with women. It seems we just put up a just, lot more. I mean, seriously, but like, yeah, especially with women, gallbladder <laughs> issues are, like, that's genuinely, like, I'm sure people watching this that have either themselves or friends that have lost a lot of weight have yeah. probably heard about that. Mm hmm So, my surgeon was thinking, like, it's the gallbladder, let's just remove it. And after, you know, talking about this on Instagram, I got a lot of feedback a lot from of people, people say, oh, saying, yeah, I had some yep, that was me too, I had the exact same symptoms, exact same things you're saying, that was me too. Got the gallbladder removed and it was perfectly fine. So I was like, cool, gallbladder it is. Mm -hmm. In this process, we did gallbladder scans, we did ultrasounds, and I never once had any any history of any um, gallstones. Mm -hmm. And I did do a scan, I wanna say it's called a HIDA scan, H-I-D-A, and it kind of gives you a percent at what your gallbladder, like sphincter, is performing at. Mm -hmm. And when they did that test, they said it was at an abnormal low level, but not, like it was like performing above average, mm -hmm. and it was considered abnormal. But not like the worst. Where there should be problems. Like I want to say, they, if I remember right, this was a long time ago, so it's hard to recall. 
But I think that like 20% was like, okay, remove it. Mm -hmm. And I think that mine was showing like 23%. Okay. So like it was pretty it low. It was pretty close then. Okay. So yeah, it, we so had a like, valid right, reason to sense. take it yeah. out. So on Cinco de Mayo, that was my surgery. I'm always around the holidays. You know, I know, just, yeah, yeah. You can never party. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But um, on Cinco de Mayo, I go in and I get it removed. This was 2019, um, you know, like, a little over a year after my surgery. And well, maybe like two weeks after, I feel the exact same oh identical pain. God. And I was like, that would be the, there's no way this isn't happening. That would be like, I'm sure at first you're probably like, I'm probably thinking that. Like it's I'm all my head. Over exaggerating. Oh, you know I was brainwashing yeah. myself. I'm yeah. like, no, you're just suck it up. Yeah. You need to stop. You're recovering from the gall gallbladder being yeah. removed. Yeah. The pain you're feeling is probably recovery yeah. pain, right? Yeah. Like, no. And then it was like even like the white bubbles and everything. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, we didn't fix it. So, of course, I just am playing the manage the pain game. I mean, I'm taking Tylenol for the pain, taking Tums for the stomach acid. Didn't really know what else to do. So. I continue doing everything that I can, live my life normal. I continue doing my gym sessions. I'm getting ready for summer shredding next year and I'm going through my tummy tucks, my boob jobs, and here and there just dealing with this stomach acid pain. It's just, it, it was an everyday thing. I mean, like I just kind of had to like learn to live with it and when it would come on, I figure out how to take care of it. And honestly, most of the time it could resolve with food, like just eating something. Eating because something what was happening was that, so with gastric bypass, you have two stomachs. Okay, this is gonna get a little weird. Mm -hmm. Let me just explain it. So with gastric bypass, you now have two stomachs. One is considered your accessory stomach. Food no longer passes through it. But it's, it's like still- the, It's the handbag stomach. It's just handbag, it's yeah, your yeah. accessory. Yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's just in there looking <laughs> cute, ready for anything. Yeah, yeah. But food's no longer passing through it. It's still functioning like a stomach. So it has the acid receptors mm -hmm. and it still secretes acid, but there's no food in there for the acid to break down. So now that I know what's happening, what was happening was that the stomach acid and my issue of overproduction with stomach acid. And I also found that people deal with overproductions of stomach acid when you deal with a lot of stress. Now, I never want to admit it, but I am a stress case mm -hmm. and I, I just stay stressing. I mean, mm -hmm. it's always been a big issue. You know how much I had going on, even in 2019 and mm -hmm. 2018 alone. I'm a big stressor. There's no hiding it. I've got a million things going on and like, that's never going to change. I'm just like a busy body. I don't know if you met my mom. It would all make perfect mm -hmm. sense. So, yes, dealing with all my big life stressors, it only caused me to keep secreting more stomach acid and it was just becoming a problem and it was having to come out. It was like this little tiny accessory stomach just was so full to, of stomach yeah. acid yeah. that it would have to come out through throwing up the stomach acid, which is why I would just have these handfuls or sinkfuls of white bubbles that was just stomach acid, no food coming out. So it was just like, okay, like what are we gonna do? And honestly, eating would usually help it, like because then the stomach acid would, would like go from like the accessory stomach mm -hmm. to like my it bigger have a stomach. Thing to do. And yeah. now you got yeah. work to do. Go break yeah. down the food. So like things like crackers, like just like bready type yeah. items would totally help. And now that I wasn't so concerned with like staying away from carbs, it was not an issue. That's it wasn't idea. getting the way of like the macros I was tracking. I could totally make it work. So in my head, I'm thinking like, I'm just kind of learning how to cope with it. If, if Tums are helping, I gotta take Tums. Like, okay, I know a lot of people who take Tums every single day. Mm -hmm. All right, take some Tums, drink some ginger ale or ginger tea always kind of helped and then just keep eating. Mm -hmm. And I had to keep eating to, you know, get my little daily macro goals done. So like, I didn't really think anything of it. Four years later, I'm going to tell you guys all the learning experiences that come along with that door. Mm -hmm. So I just, just, I didn't think anything of it. I just kind of thought, you know, I'm doing what I have to do to get through this pain mm -hmm. and also get through my fitness goals, mm -hmm. priorities. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, everything was like, you know, just, I was just kind of dealing with it. And as long as I was eating and taking my Tums, I could get ahead of it and it would be a quick fix. I kind of get the pain taken care of. I get to go back to the gym, to get, get on with my day. So it didn't really, it, it started becoming an even bigger issue. Um, okay. So yeah, let's, let's go through it. So that was all 2019. I'm working with Maddie. I'm going through my plastic surgeries. March of 2020, uh, right before the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. um, me and Maddie, we worked together. We had just launched workout programs. We were so stoked because I had just gotten cleared to go back into the gym after dealing with a six month recovery. Mm -hmm. I was out of the gym all that time and I was so stoked to get back into the gym. March of 2020, mm -hmm. the week before the pandemic hit. Yeah. So then more time out of the yep. gym, as you know, especially living here in California. Mm -hmm. But um, it was like March 
15th or something that we launched our workout programs that we had created together. And I was so stoked because I was gonna be back in the gym, hitting it hard, me and Maddie were just gonna be a whole new plan. Mm -hmm. I was gonna be getting ready for summer shredding, which was that June. Mm -hmm. And I think I started my prep, I, I was gonna be set to start competition prep either March March or April. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was either March or April. And then all of a sudden, you know, the gym's closed down. Mm -hmm. And Maddie lived in Nebraska at the time. Mm -hmm. And I had never been out there, but she was like, you know what? All the gyms where you live are closed. Um, everything's open here. Why don't you just move out here? Temporary, like just a couple months. Mm -hmm. Like there's a bunch of apartments open months, here. Yeah. So I was like, you know what? Why not? So mm -hmm. I go to live in Nebraska for four months um, just while I'm on my competition prep to be close to her and her husband, who are my coaches. And I was like right down the hall from them, it was great. And um, as I'm like doing that, I'm like now also dealing with the pain just at a further distance, way mm -hmm. further distance. And I'm like, okay, it's not that it's like getting worse, but like obviously no one wants to have to be popping Tums yeah, every day. It's not getting better either. It's not like, getting better yeah. every day either. So, um, and like after I was on my competition prep, like one month in, I had already also started losing more weight and I started seeing more muscle definition. It was all really exciting. And as I'm like putting such a like heavy focus on my physique, I'm also very concerned with like, you know, what's going on inside. Like mm -hmm. at the end of the day, of course I want to look great, but like the goal at the end of all of this has always been like, I want to have a happy and healthy life. I just mm -hmm. want to have a normal, happy and healthy life. That's why I had the gastro bypass surgery, mm -hmm. right? And you know, you can look good on the outside, but like what's happening on the inside also is equally as important. So like dealing with like stomach acid coming out and like seeing like um, hearing more and more at this point, like a year of that, as I would tell people like, yeah, I'm taking Tums for it. People would be like, you know, you shouldn't take Tums every day. Mm -hmm. That could be, that, could, that there's like some health issues with that. Yeah, like yeah. I think people have like experienced some really bad things with like overdoing it on the Tums. Mm -hmm. And I was just taking it like, you know, a few times a day to help with it. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, well, if that's gonna be an issue, I definitely need to get down to the bottom of this because mm -hmm. I don't want any further health issues. Yeah. I got gastric bypass to help me not deal with any further health mm -hmm. issues like high blood pressure, letting my hypothyroid get any worse and you know, anything like that. So at the end of the day, I've always known that that was very important and that that should be my priority. So from a distance, I would be, you know, setting up these appointments and it always takes so long just to get the appointment. So like you can set an appointment to get seen by your bariatric surgeon, but it might take two to three months, mm -hmm. four months just to get that appointment taken care of. So it kind of didn't matter that I was like at a distance, I would just like fly home after the three months of waiting. Mm -hmm. So finally I go home, I travel from Omaha back home here out in like outside of LA and um, where my surgeon's at. And he tells me, you know what? We got to see what's going on inside. Let's schedule a gastro endoscopy. And if you guys don't know what that is, it's they put a camera down your throat. Gastro is like the Latin root for medical like terminology for stomach. So it's literally putting a camera down your throat to look inside your stomach. So um, we did that, and after that procedure, <sighs> okay, so this is like where everything gets really messy. So after that procedure, I get a call from the bariatric surgeon's office, and they tell me, you have a new um, prescription, and it's gonna be called Omeprazole. This medication, it can be bought over the counter, but we're gonna prescribe it to you. It's gonna be covered by your insurance, and what it does is it's gonna help, help with like the stomach acid production take this once a day, you can take it more if needed, but at least start taking it with once a day and it should help with the stomach acid production. So I started taking my omeprazole and um, it definitely helped. I was like, wow, where was this medication all along? Like if this is healthier than taking a bunch of Tums, I wish I would've known about it sooner. Mm -hmm. But um, then I shared about it on Instagram, like, hey, I got a new medication that's supposed to help with this. Cause as I, you know, the years that have been going on as I share my journey, I obviously always share about what's going on. Like I'm not gonna talk about the pain I'm in every single day, but yeah, as soon as I get yeah. new updates and stuff and um, I give like every like six month updates on that kind of stuff, um, I'm gonna tell people like, hey, this is what I'm doing now for the pain mm -hmm. and it's actually working. So I always give little updates like that. So I let everyone know what came of the gastroendoscopy was, is I got my prescription, omeprazole, and it is helping a little bit. It doesn't take away the pain completely, but like I was dealing with it a lot less, mm -hmm. which was great. So that's going on. And then that was in, that gastroendoscopy was performed in June of 2020. Okay. Okay? Middle of 2020. You ready for this timeline? Uh-huh. Middle of 2020. Had the gastroendoscopy. I was given medication. Mm -hmm. I end up in the ER three times in a matter of a week in December of 2021 mm -hmm. due to 
pain. I've got a, I've got a crazy pain tolerance. People think mm -hmm. I'm absolutely psycho because I just, I fight through it and I know it's terrible because I like, I've got a million things going on. So mm -hmm. I'm like, if I'm sick, like, yeah, or if I'm, I'm like opposite. feeling a little under the weather. I'm such a weenie. I think a lot of guys are like yeah, that. Yeah, I'm such it's a, a guy weenie. Thing. I'm like, oh, my tooth hurts. It's a guy thing. I gotta Please, take the week off. If, if anyone is watching this and you have a boyfriend or a husband or something <laughs> and they get sick with the same cold you had, you could be like, I will have Not like the, the same week. little cold. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, I was down for a day or two. My boyfriend, when he gets that cold, uh -huh. oh my gosh, it's a week. Yeah. I have to cook everything yeah. for him. He can't get out of bed. And that's just, it's just how it goes. It's but it's okay. Blue. It's okay. You guys do great in other places, just not when you're sick and down for the count. <laughs> so so a year and a half goes by. Yep. And you're in the ER. I'm in the times. ER with this pain, level level ten pain. Okay. I'm like nonverbal. I'm just like I I am unwell. I mm -hmm. cannot. And it was the week of my birthday, Christmas, right before New Year's. I'm supposed to be thriving, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm ready to have my birthday party. No. No, no, no. Um, I'm in the ER just dealing with this pain. We're trying to get down to the bottom of it. Now, as I'm in the ER, no one wants to look at me because I'm a bariatric patient, and that always kind of gives a lot of, no one wants to touch you as soon as they find out you're a bariatric patient because just like any other surgeon, you know, see, surgeons are known for like their big egos and stuff. Mm -hmm. So like surgeons, bariatric surgeons will get very upset with other doctors if they try doing anything on mm -hmm. their patients, which I get because like, Bariatric patients are just a whole different yes, ball game, yeah. right? Like you should be seen by someone who knows bariatrics specifically. Mm -hmm. I get that. So I would be in the ER and they would tell me like, we can't do anything. Like we have to call Dr. Billy before we even do this type of test, before we mm -hmm. even do this test. I know what I want to do. I want to I want to do this exam examination on you, but I have to run everything by your surgeon. So because of that, it would kind of like cause these extra timelines and delays and I would just have to like kind of deal with the pain a lot longer than most people in the ER would have to, or I would be sent home and then be told that you gotta go schedule an appointment with your bariatric surgeon. So all this stuff. So um, as I'm in the ER, you know, Dr. Billy's like, all right, you gotta, um, we, need, we need you to come back into the office. So I come back in a few weeks later, uh, this was like early January now of 2022. Okay, yeah, January 2022. So like literally a year, a year mm. ago. And he pulls up my notes and he's like, all right, so what, what are we on? You have your omeprazole. We did the gastroendoscopy. You're on your omeprazole. And then he's like, he's looking on his computer scrolling. He goes, what? Hold on. Wait a second. I see in the notes here that when I did that gastroendoscopy on you, it says right here, and I will never forget it. I haven't memorized what he said, okay? He said, read from the notes, there was an ulcer with cratered and flappy material that could not be resolved through surgery or that could not be resolved through medication that would need surgery. And we never notified you. So I'm like, wait, what? He's like, no one ever notified you of the cratered, flappy ulcer in your stomach. No one ever notified you. And so I was like, oh my gosh, that was two years ago. I was sitting in there in January, 2022, that gastroendoscopy was June of 2020. Here I am just going through the pain every single day. And he, you know, he tells me people that have an ulcer Especially not even people who have cratered and flappy ulcers. Yours is worse than Super them. ulcer. Super, super yeah. ulcer. He was like, people who have an ulcer, they get medical leave. They are no longer working a normal job. They don't have a normal life. You are in bed rest most days. And I'm like, well, if I told, I mean, I could tell you every day I want to be in bed rest, but I've just never allowed myself to do that because mm -hmm. I've got a lot going on. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I've been living in a level 10 pain off and on throughout the day, playing the managed pain game all day, Jeez. every day. So he's like, yeah, there was never any chance that with how progressed this is, that it could be resolved through surgery, uh, that, that it could be resolved through medication. It would need surgery. So that's when we officially started all the conversations and the road to me getting my ulcer removed. But unfortunately, just like all the other surgeries with bariatric patients, there's like Forever. a whole roadmap to go through yeah. just to get my ulcer removed. I had to do an EKG, like the, you know, like heart stress chest on, on the bike. I had to go do three different rounds of lab work. What else? I had to go, um, they put like all the electrodes on me and did another test. I'm totally blanking what it's called. I had to do H. pylori tests so they could see if there's like um, different type of like bacteria mm -hmm. in your stomach. Like there's just so many things. So it did take um, up to a year to um, complete all of those. And on December, I want to say 14th of this year, was when I finally got a surgery date. And I just had the surgery to get the ulcer removed 
this January, just a couple weeks ago on the on the 16th, and um, the the technical surgery that I got, it's not just called like an ulcer removal, it's called an exploratory laparoscopic small bowel resection with truncal vagotomy. Now, when my surgeon was laying out the options, let me tell you about the options that I had to deal with this ulcer. There was removing the ulcer, which is what I ended up choosing. The other options were reverse the gastric bypass. And that terrified me because yeah. I was like, what if I just get back up to 300 pounds yeah, again? Because yeah. All these people on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube are telling me, Des, don't you think you could just take everything you've learned now after having surgery and you would be fine with reversing your gastric bypass? Well, let me take it back further for you guys who are a little newer here. My story always has been is that like I didn't really learn anything new with mm -hmm. that. I've always had the same regimen. I've always tried everything. Mm -hmm. it, it was my hypothyroid that got me there. And so I definitely feared just gaining my weight back mm -hmm. if that were the case the other option was to simply just not do anything at all and i was just like well the last thing i want to do is continue living my yeah. literal everyday life playing the manage the pain game all mm -hmm. over again so that's why i did decide to go through with surgery now in the meantime i am talking to like my primary doctor letting her know about all this kind of stuff too because everyone's like so concerned like does this is a lot of surgeries it's a lot of surgeries mm -hmm. It's not my idea. Yeah. I don't want all these surgeries. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I would have to, you know, go under just for plastics three times. Mm -hmm. I wish I would have been like one of those people who gets like their boobs done with their tummy tuck. Okay, I wasn't. Mm -hmm. It sucks. Whatever. Yeah. We can move past that. I definitely wish I didn't go through any allergic reactions where I have to go under twice just for boobs again, but here we are. I'm not asking to be put under. I'm not wanting all these surgeries. It's not my idea to say surgery is the answer. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Dr. Billy was really recommending that I do this surgery. And he definitely believed that it could it could work. I was hesitant because he also said that about the gallbladder. Yeah. So of course here I am. I it all falls on me. It was a hard decision. He told yeah. me that I'm the only one that can make this decision. He can give me all of his recommendations and advice. I could go and tell all my options to everyone online, and the millions of people who think their doctors can tell me what they think as well. Yeah. Dude. You can't even imagine the position it put me in yeah. in this like last year, just trying to figure out what is the right thing to do. Everyone thinks I'm Frankenstein because all I want is all these surgeries. It's like, okay, I don't want a bunch of surgeries, yeah. okay? I'm not asking for it. Mm -hmm. Stop looking for the next procedure to get the body you want. Mm -hmm. Oh, look, if you just didn't want so, if you didn't want to try so hard to be skinny, then you would have never had to deal with all of these surgeries. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I really hope that people kind of listen to my story and my heart a little bit more before they say stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, these are just kind of like the actual reality complications that can come along with all these things. Mm -hmm. that, you know, you just, you, it's one of those things you like, kind of don't think will happen to you until it happens to you. Yeah. And unfortunately, I've just been the person that kind of deal with, deals with all of them and has to be the strong one to tell the story at the end of it. Yeah. So, yeah. How, that's so, where we're at. <laughs> how have you been feeling since the surgery now? Have, have since you, the surgery? Um, how long has it been, by the way, since then? It has been. 21 days since my okay. surgery so, very so recently, yeah we are just at like three weeks post-op right now and um well I scared everyone okay mm -hmm. I scared everyone I told them on January 17th I went in for this surgery and when I told everyone online what the surgery was that second part the truncal vagotomy mm -hmm. you want to know what that means what does it mean all right so let me explain this to you okay uh, this is where everyone's freaking out okay mm -hmm. Uh, you have these vagus nerves that start from your brain and they travel down in your body to like around your stomach mm -hmm. and Dr. Billy recommended that we snip those because when you stress they produce extra stomach acid and it just sends more stomach acid into your stomach but also um, they are like in charge of like acid production so like it's also kind of like the gallbladder like where you can live with them you can live without them like mm -hmm. it's kind of one of those things like some people just like, you can have them, you don't need them. Like, whatever. So that's how Dr. Billy explained it to me. I agree to the surgery. Mm -hmm. As soon as I start telling everyone online about the truncal vagotomy he's performed on me, everyone tells me, holy, I can't believe that you got that surgery. No one over, no one under the age of 60 is getting that surgery. Mm -hmm. I hope you make it past 35 years old, Des. Mm -hmm. I hope that you're able to live another decade maybe five years. Mm -hmm. Everyone's telling me, I can't believe you got the truncal vagotomy. Like, yeah, even though they're snipping the nerves down here around your stomach, 
It's not like I got like cranial surgery or anything, mm -hmm. but everyone was like, oh my gosh, I've never heard of a doctor performing like a vagus nerve or like anything to do with vagus nerves on someone in their 20s. Mm -hmm. I'm 29, just turned 29 in December. And um, yeah, like they were just like, that's unheard of. I can't believe your doctor. You need to find a new doctor ASAP. You are done seeing this doctor. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, well, well here I am. I'm just listening to the recommendations from my surgeon, I'm, I, I am taking my time to ask the questions and like, you know, speak up on my pain. And like, it, that was just like what his idea was, was surgery. And I don't know, I didn't think I was making the bad decision, but even, you know, actually before the surgery, I did go through and I tried to see what, what about like switching to a new surgeon for a second opinion. And with my insurance, I couldn't, I couldn't switch it over. So I just kind of bit the bullet on that. But luckily with like, being in so like involved in the WLS community online, I'm really close and have amazing relationships with a few bariatric surgeons online. Yeah. And they've always given me really safe places to ask my questions that, you know, sometimes my surgeon won't be so e eager to listen to. Mm -hmm. So like I did run it by a few of like those doctors as well. And they were like, yeah, I think it's gonna be good for you. So like, I didn't think anything of it. I thought, okay, this is gonna be it. I was stoked that this surgery was basically gonna be like the answer to never having to deal with this pain ever again. Mm -hmm. So, I'm in the hospital on uh, just a couple three weeks ago. I'm in the hospital. I'm getting this surgery. I'm so excited to like bring everyone along like the answer because as I'm telling people more and more about the complications, there's an entire community of people who are dealing with the exact same thing with zero answers just like me. Mm -hmm. So like it's become a mission of mm -hmm. mine to get these answers. I want to help everyone else who's dealing with the same stuff, right? So here I am, I'm stoked. I'm like, all right guys, we're doing this. Like we're getting better. We are on the road to getting better. I'm so stoked. And then I wake up from surgery. I'm super loopy. And then they hit me with okay welcome back you know everything's looking good you're gonna feel a little sore you've got five laparoscopic scars um you're gonna feel a little sore we need to really focus on you um getting some water in and we want to see you walking around soon in the hospital doing little laps so i'm like okay cool but then they come in a, no a new nurse comes in and she's like has the doctor spoken to you yet i'm like no they're like okay we're gonna have to run some tests on you i'm like oh okay why are we doing tests like, you're going to be staying overnight. I was like, I just got out of surgery. I I had no intention of staying overnight at the mm -hmm. hospital after the surgery. I didn't think it was going to be an overnight stay. They let me know I'm probably going to be staying three nights because of the complications that are arising. I'm like, complications? Mm -hmm. What? Like, mm -hmm. wait, what complications? For the first time ever, I don't know what happened in this surgery. I don't know. They're, they said that it could have been due to, like, a, like the amount of blood I lost. But I started dealing with um, uh, low like oxygen, mm -hmm. low blood pressure, which I've never dealt with before. And then also, um, oh gosh, what else? Sorry, let me think about everything that happened. It was like low, low oxygen, low blood pressure. And then I also was dealing with um, high blood sugar. I have never dealt with anything mm -hmm. like that before. So they were talking about giving me insulin. I had to go in and take like um, ultrasound, CAT scan, more blood work. No, I did three rounds of blood work and I was in there for three days. And they also said that my hemoglobin, I was, might have to get a blood transfusion because my hemoglobin was low. I was at like 0.7 and they said like anything below like 0.5 would need a transfusion. So, um, they did tell me that I'm gonna have to see like a hemoglobin specialist very soon, like after I'm like done fully recovering mm -hmm. to like get that like up and running. But yeah, I almost had to do like a blood, infu uh, blood infusion or everything. And it was just insane. Like all these complications, I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. Like, and everyone on Instagram was just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're dealing with all these complications. But then once I was released after three days, I go back home and then I just like this, on set debilitating like i can't breathe i can't speak like i'm nonverbal, hyperventilating crying and i don't cry mm -hmm. okay i am like people make fun of me at how bad i try to be tough like i mm -hmm. will tough out everything like i'm it's just it's like i i will never want to show pain i will fight through i will tell myself it's not there like you know you're busy like you mm -hmm. don't have to do that but i couldn't even like i could not deal with it at all so i ended up back in the er after my after i was already sent home and then my surgeon was really upset about that. And so then he had me come back in and then he told me, well, you know, it's not like you got hit by a bus. You're expected to be in pain. And I was like, right. And I'm like literally hyperventilating and being like, I can't breathe. 
all the way. It was like shallow breathing, shallow breathing. I can't take it in. It's just, I will no, I can't. Jeez. So yeah, that was my recovery. I am so glad to tell you that yes, I had to suck it up because it was not like I was hit by a bus. Mm -hmm. So I was sent home to deal with the pain. Tylenol had to do the trick. And um, yeah, it, it was the worst. It was the hardest recovery. You know, all those surgeries I've been through, yeah. that was the hardest recovery I have ever been through. And I think now after a few conversations I've had online, you know what's crazy is I'm a couple years older now, mm -hmm. so that might be playing a role in it. But also because of the other surgeries I've had, I've got a lot more scar tissue. I mean, and yeah, so that, makes sense. that that is probably a big reason. But yeah, I just I couldn't believe that like I just started dealing with even more complications. Yeah. But I'm stoked to tell you that I'm three weeks out now. Mm -hmm. The only bit of pain I feel is like the actual where they incisions. have incisions uh -huh. and stuff. So like I feel like the pain that I'm feeling is you know, recovery pain, mm -hmm. and I'm just, I'm still healing from that, and it is getting less and less every day. Um, and I haven't felt like that upper stomach pain that travels to my back, mm -hmm. that causes me to like throw up and be in a fetal position mm -hmm. at all since the surgery. That's good. So I do think that it was a success in that way. Mm -hmm. Does everyone think that I'm absolutely crazy for going through that surgery and do they think that I might not live for another five years? Yes, but actually I don't know if I told you what part of the reason why I was in OC today was that I met um, in Orange County was I met with Dr. Russo who's a bariatric surgeon and I met him through Instagram and I told him about all that and like me meeting my new doctor this last week and like about the comments that are coming in online and stuff and he really reassured me that like no, 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 people are kind of taking other vagus nerve um, procedures and mm -hmm. kind of putting it Long on your ears. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and like it's just it's a little bit different and I will be making a video with him next Friday to kind of elaborate on that because I don't want to scare a bunch of people mm -hmm. um, and I'm like at the end of all of this I just want people to know that like a lot of the complications that I'm dealing with like could have been prevented had I not been um, neglected to be notified of the results of my yeah. gastroendoscopy. Yeah, so like I don't want to scare a bunch of people who are considering weight loss surgery. I don't want to just tell you that these are the issues that everyone's going to deal with because not everyone's going to put their pain on the back burner like me and not everyone's going to be stupid and not think that this is more serious than it is. Mm -hmm. At the end of it, I learned that stress can do a lot more to your body than just your mental, okay? Like mm -hmm. it actually can affect your body. It can cause a hole in your stomach. Yeah. It can cause so much acid production in your body that you can burn a hole in your stomach through all the stress. Get your mental health under control, okay? Number two, use your voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never want to be confrontational and I don't want to tell Dr. Billy and his staff like, no, something doesn't sound right. I need to stop worrying about being the nice girl and yeah. speak up when I really feel my, my mm -hmm. gut says otherwise. And also I need to do my own follow-up calls after procedures and stuff and maybe ask, learn to ask more questions. Yeah. And um, when I was given that med medicine prescription, I should have asked, is this gonna heal it? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I had to learn that. I get, I, I guess I just figured it would heal it. That's yeah. why they prescribed it to heal mm -hmm. the ulcer. So, um, or actually, I hadn't even been, t I hadn't been notified that it was an ulcer. I, to me, they just said it was an overproduction. So I figured, all right, they're giving me the medication to stop the overproduction, and mm -hmm. I accepted and I went on. So it's all about you know like learning the, qu the harder questions to ask and elaborating and just doing your own follow-ups and I feel like if I hadn't have been neglected to be notified of these results I could have gotten it taken care of a whole lot sooner and I wouldn't have had to go through all the chaos mm. but I'm glad that at the end of it you know we do have more answers and I just hope that anyone else who's going through it they can skip the years yeah. of steps that yeah. I took you know yeah that was a lot I'm yeah, sorry I think I'm a I talker think... I know I did not stop it's all good no it makes my, my, my it makes my job easier. Yeah, I'm a You don't pro have any questions now. for me? No, I'm good. You're not weirded out by the two stomachs? No, I'm, that's, I was going to make a, a cow joke, but then I said, nah, I probably shouldn't. Because I think cows have like five or something like that. But I was like, Stop. Yeah, that's just, yeah, they have like multiple stomachs. Four, that maybe? makes me a little uncomfortable. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's I thought why I was my like, two I, made I, When I heard it, I was like, a cow. But I was like, no, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's it. Thank you so much. You for, are so welcome. For coming on. I appreciate it. Of course. Um, I mean, this is obviously at the end of the video. It'll be at the beginning, but if someone wants to follow you, where would they? Oh, you can yeah. find me on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube under Woke Up Like Des. My name's Desiree. Everyone calls me Des, so the handle's Woke Up Like Des. And I hope to see you there. Perfect, yeah. It'll be linked in the description. Thank, oh, thank you, again. you Thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm super stoked. I've been following him forever, so this was a little surreal. <laughs>